thank uh, Google for hosting us. It's very generous to them, and there's actually a whole number of people involved in getting this all set up and making this happen. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, List NYC membership. Um, we've actually just started a digital membership drive, so to speak. Um, List NYC Matters is a as a member of the community, you can help contribute to our mission. Our List and Summer Projects programming competition was a great success this year, and we'd like to continue our educational program, sponsor illustrious out-of-town speakers, and are establishing a membership service to do that. We actually have several levels of monthly support. You can actually support us at $5 a month, $10 a month, or $20 a month, and we accept uh, Amazon, PayPal, and Bitcoin. This is actually all on the official listnyc.org website. And the URL for membership is simply lispnyc.org slash support. Um, if you think about it, um, you know, if we go out for a drink, your first beer will be like $5. So it's just that in order to bring people in, we're actually working on getting Peter Norvig and Jerry Sussman in this fall, um, but we actually need to pay for their accommodations, and we just we, we need money. So, um, And if, you're don if you actually donate um, an amount totaling more than $30, you will receive a limited edition List NYC t-shirt that will look surprisingly like this. So, um, so please uh, support uh, List NYC. Um, that's really all I have to say. We have some really exciting meetups coming up. Uh, next month we have uh, Luth Rawl, who's actually in the audience, who's going to be presenting on set theory. Um, the following month we have somebody uh, presenting on Genera 7, which is, um, I mean, Open Genera, which is the operating system for the Symbolics List Machines and probably one of the most amazing operating systems I've actually had the pleasure of working with. And in May, um, one of the Haskell organizers will be presenting homotopy type theory, which is a really exciting branch of mathematics. Um, and, um, and we've got plenty of other exciting events coming up. Anyway, without further ado, please welcome Brandon Bloom. So I guess is this recording and everything should be good well, there? Over there? These various systems are actually what's used for designing uh, and effectively the implementation of things in formal semantics, you know, operational and denotational semantics. So we're going to look at a little bit of that just to kind of get a feel for where this stuff comes from, and then we'll get into some like actual running examples. Here's like a really simple set of a couple of rules from some operational semantics for a very simple language. Here I've got uh, lookups of symbols and booleans. So you can see that the rules have a form of a configuration to a configuration. Basically, this is just a function that takes in a pair of type expression and state. And that's a configuration. And it rewrites some expression and some state into a new configuration. So for example, in lookups here, you see I have some expression x and some state, which is a, a mapping of bindings, the, the current variable bindings, uh, sigma. And then a rule that says that replace x with sigma at x uh, if sigma is not bottom, basically if x is uh, if x is in the map sigma, so that's just saying if you have a program or a machine that is represented by some expression and some set of variables, you can rewrite that machine into a new machine, and that's just a very simple rewrite rule in an operational semantic sort of style. So here's a few more examples to show how you do things like Boolean operations. Uh, you can see that first rule there. It says B and sigma go to B prime and sigma is basically saying uh, that you you know do evaluation of arguments. You say not true goes to false, not false goes to true. But it's interesting you also see false and B just goes to false. We just throw away the B, so we don't even care what that is. So these are these are how you can do Boolean in a non-primitive way because you have the equality of of the symbols and of the the mathematical values here and. Uh, this is just a very simple slice of operational semantics. And so you'll see these if you read a lot of research papers where they talk about new programming languages or features. You'll run into these sorts of rules. And hopefully you'll be able to like understand them or not be terrified of those like little piles of equations in the future. Or maybe you can explore after this talk and get comfortable with them, which would be, uh, I think I have done my job in that case. I don't understand. Yeah. The first one there, underneath lookup and bools, what, yes. what's, what's the meaning of that exactly? Sorry, uh, so these, this is a real tiny subslice. So a real set of operational manics, so this is for a very simple language, has a lot more stuff. This is just an example saying that, uh, that uh, I'm forgetting how this goes 
here. I mean, what does the arrow? What's the arrow? What's it? What to use? So these are these are rewrite rules. I think this line is in this context. There, everyone has slightly different notation. Um, I forget exactly. How do you use these, these 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 things up there? What's the meaning of it? Often, if it's logic, it, you will have a set of axioms, then you'll have rewrite rules. And the set of valid theorems is the set of all th things eventually produced by applying. Sure. So I believe, I believe so in this, what is this. I believe in this context, what they were trying to show here. I forget what the the, the line here means. Right. Um, in this particular example, like I said, they, they, these vary. Uh, I think what they were trying to show here was that if you have uh, some b, it gets evaluated to another b. I think they were trying to show uh, something about strategy of which rules to apply when, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. You don't really need to actually understand these particular rules. I just wanted to show ah, an example okay, of that. That's an interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, no, that's that's a semantic. Right. So so we'll we'll talk more about. I believe uh, that one. Then. <laughs> we'll talk we'll talk more about about evaluation strategy in a moment. Okay. Thanks. Again, just so you see what they look like. Right. Uh, so these sorts of rewrite systems are are really really powerful. In fact, um, because they use them to describe new languages, right, and they use them to talk about how the formal semantics of things work. In computer uh, scientists, yeah, blah, blah, blah. in computer science, um, these rewrite systems are really, really powerful. <laughs> but the problem is they might be a little too powerful. They may be too powerful to use as a programming paradigm because, well, there's a few reasons why. Um, the two I want to talk about is that most properties, like almost all of them, of an abstract rewrite system are undecidable. So we're talking about things about like termination. Uh, confluence, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, all, all these different properties that that say what, what behavior these different rewrite systems have, they're all undecidable for arbitrary rewrite systems. And they're very easy to come up with rewrite systems that are just completely unmanageable in terms of, of what properties they have. Additionally, they're limited in their abstractive enca encapsulation capability. Uh, and we'll talk more about what that means in a moment. but. But briefly, it basically says, because you have the entire machine state and you have some rule that you're applying to it, um, or you have some sub-expression or some segment of the machine state, you can basically just willy-nilly reach inside any expression and change things. And that power is welcome sometimes, but it's also unmanageable other times. So here's one of the properties I mentioned. This is confluence. So here is a arithmetic expression, where arithmetic expression, I'm mispronouncing words tonight. Uh, if you look at this expression, confluence means that you can take an expression and rewrite it by applying the rules in any given order and get the same result. So you know that from math, you can apply the evaluation on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, and no matter which way you go, you get the same answer. As you can imagine, if you have these really powerful rules, it's actually very easy to create rules that don't have this property. And so um, this is one of the properties that's that's uh, the rules for the evaluation order matters. Right. Where when which so the goal here is that you could imagine a rule that had maybe a side effect yeah. or it produced something that no other rule matches. Yeah. Um, and you can wind up where no matter if you reply this rule first or this rule first, yeah. you get a different result. Yeah, exactly. And so it's important when people are designing formal semantics for languages that you have properties like confluence, otherwise you're like, what happened? It, you got a different answer, and you run it again, and you get a different answer, right? Because of scheduling of, of commands. Um, and so in our single-threaded execution environment, properties like confluence are pretty important for reasoning as, as, as people do. So uh, this is what the topic where we talked about strategies I mentioned. So this is what rules are applied when. And if you look at this Wikipedia page, <clears throat> there's an overview of sort of the popular mainstream evaluation styles, uh, evaluation strategies that are in programming languages today. So stuff like uh, normal order, appli uh, uh, applicative order, call by name, call by need, lazy evaluation. When you evaluate what and what order, those strategies are basically rules for a rewrite system, or rules is not the right word, for our, our strategies for when to apply rules in a rewrite system. Um, and you can conceive of many, many, many different strategies, and we'll, we'll play with strategies in the demo in a little bit. But that's what people talk about when they talk about their language evaluation strategy. They're talking about the formal semantics of what gets rewritten when. Here's, here's a, simple from, a simple example of an evaluation strategy that Lisp uses. 
basically there's sort of a hybrid of two strategies. One is this top-down macro expansion strategy, which is you find the rules, which could be the syntax rules if you have like a scheme. The, the syntax rules language is actually a term rewriting language, and that applies rules as they match from the top down and expands inner expressions down to the bottom. But then evaluation is applicative order. So basically it does not proceed into lambda forms. It does not do any evaluation under a binder like that, but it does evaluate the arguments first. So here you say we have let, we expand to a lambda. Here we have another uh, let, we expand to a lambda. Here now we've fully expanded, so we go back the other way. We say we evaluate this argument, we evaluate this argument, we use substitution, we evaluate this argument, we use substitution. And so this strategy of macro expand down and then evaluate up is a popular strategy among Lisps. And, uh, and so you can actually code this strategy into a term rewriting system relatively straightforwardly. I don't have enough time to go into an example that detailed, but I, I encourage you to take the code that I'm going to give today and see if you can extend it to do this sort of thing. Um, the other thing I want to show, let's see if I have some sound here. Uh-oh. I'm going to echo. I don't know if it's going to be um, annoying. But this is a little app on the web called Bubble Pop from uh, the Haskell community. And basically, you click on these bubbles. Uh, you can't hear the awesome popping noise. Sorry. It's so fun. Go to this URL and play with this for like hours. Because then you click on the bubbles, they, they cause evaluation. And so because of lazy evaluation and no side effects, you can evaluate sub-expressions in basically whatever order you click them. And so you can actually think of um, Haskell's formal semantics as being a graph rewriting system or a term rewriting system on, on the graph structure of all the relationships between values. And so you can, you can click on all these and, and just kind of get a feel for what evaluates when. It's pretty fun. You want to write down a URL? You want to wait a moment? He called, you got it? Uh, he called it Geek's Candy Crush. Oh man, it's so good. I, when I found this, I was just like giggling because the sound is so satisfying. It's so satisfying. Cool. So, so uh, to me, sort of the essence of term rewriting is this idea that the next slide should come. The idea that everything's an expression. So all of the data that the term rewriting language operates on is um, is an expression, something that you can express, like you can write down the things that get evaluated. So all of the data in the system are just like the source code of the system, right? It's something that always represents this, this expressible data. It's usually tree-shaped, it doesn't have to be, but for argument's sake, we're gonna say it is. Um, this is not true in most functional languages. Most languages have things that are not expressible. So I think I come back to that point in a moment. Uh, here's a very simple expression grammar. Here is basically like the bare minimum you need to implement a term rewriting in terms of the data types you need, right? You have an expression is a symbol or an integer and you don't even technically need integers uh, or a term. And a term is a symbol, which we call the head, plus a list of expressions. Um, and then we have you know, symbols and integers. So this is just like a really simple grammar for a really simple term rewriting language. Not only is this the grammar for the language, these are the type definitions for every data type in those languages as well, which is, that, which is the point when I'm saying it's the essence of term rewriting is that all the data being operated on is expressible. So in Racket, if you type in lambda x or whatever, the output's procedure like this, right? That little pound sign with the open you know, bracket, that means that's not expressible. You can't copy paste that into your REPL and get out another lambda. Um, this is true in closure as well. You get this hideous thing, which is just like class names and nonsense. But, but the really interesting thing is that you get some admission here. They're saying, okay, truth is we have object identity. And it actually tells you the identity of the object, what memory address this thing's at, or hash identity it's at in the JVM or whatever. And so this is an admission that, okay, really, we don't work, like not everything in our language is expressible. So if you put a quote in front of Lambda, then you will get you will get an expression, but it is not a lambda. It is a different data type. So in common Lisp, uh, SBC, uh, SBCL, we get a little bit more information out. So you'll see that, like, well, we have the argument list, right? And this is, this is saying, yeah, there's some metadata in there. It's saying, but it's still, it's still not the... Um, 
That's true, but you can also, at least in SPCL, you can get a disassembly for it. So yes, you can. That's a very different sort of thing, however. Yeah. So in Clojure as well, you can ask for the source of the code. And what it does is it looks at metadata on the object and then goes back to the source file. In, uh, in, um, in most common list implementations that have like real compilers and stuff, you can get disassembly, you can get um, some attempt at decompilation, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a different data type. You can also get interpreted lambdas. You can, you can. But it's, it's very different than, than two other things I want to show. One is Haskell. In which case, they just don't even bother trying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's a failure to understand category theory. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. So this, this, uh, this makes me feel like this. Um, so I just, <laughs> I just want like, uh, mean, Meanwhile, um, on the other end of the spectrum, so, so you could, uh, oh, of course I hit back. So in, in any of these languages, or especially in Haskell, where you have like type classes, I could implement an expressible type class yeah. and give it to, ha to has that expression and make some new constructors that create my instance of my type that creates some expressionable, expressable thing and has like some function that turns the underlying thing and disassembles it or decompiles it back into an expression. And in fact, that's what actually happens in most real systems uh, that do term rewriting is that internally they have secret data types that all of them have a like canonical back to expression operation. And so that's a sort of procedural view of a structural representation. Yeah. So if I wrote let function one be lambda x plus x2, and then if uh, function two, lambda x plus x2, <laughs> try pass this there. So you're talking about lexical closures? No, it's so, talking about whether or not they're EQ or whether or not they're EQ. Oh, they're EQ. Yeah. Ah, so if they are object identity as in closure and in most lists, then they will not be EQ. Right. Um, but they may be structurally equivalent. So I know that Racket, for example, if they have the same source code position, will actually like check all the slots in the closure and weird things like that. So there's some caveats there. But if you look at Mathematica back in 1988, and you type in function of x goes to x plus 2, what do you get out? You get function of x goes to x plus two, right? And that's it. It's done. Like it's it's evaluated. It. Yeah. But internally, I mean, maybe so, not in Mathematica, but internally, if you wanted a real system, you'd have to actually compile to something. So so you can interpret this directly. It'll be slow. The point is is that it's abstract to you. So if Mathematica internally represents this as a compiled procedure, it does not let you know. So the point here is that there 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 are actually. Um, potentially encapsulated types. But the system can change them on you, and the interface that you experience is always one of expressions. Right. And, so, and so the abstract data type presented to you is one slightly more rich than the, the AST I showed you earlier, uh, the grammar I showed you earlier. So yes, this very well could have data behind it uh, that is much richer. But all of the operations that apply to any expression apply to this expression as well. So I imagine that in very, very early lists that were interpreted, you would actually get back. Exactly. Yeah, so, so if you write an interpreted list, it's really quite very easy to just always operate on the list structures. Right, right. Um, so you it's have an interest. It's also buggy because it does closures. Well, yeah, so, so it's also buggy because it's not closures. So the other question that I thought you were asking earlier, I just wasn't following your, your letters, is a question of uh, closures. So typically, term rewriting systems, or at least historically, are based on substitution uh, instead of on uh, lexical closures. And so in order to uh, emulate closures, your evaluation strategy needs to do variable renaming and substitution uh, to avoid name capture. Mm. And so you can actually emulate lexical closures by doing eager substitution. Uh, now that, that has some caveats. In fact, Mathematica does do that. And it, it, lo it looks like you have a lexical closure, but in reality it just did eager substitution and, and alpha renaming. Yep. Does, that, does that make sense? Cool. All right. So um, Mathematica is not the only, nor is it the first. As we already discussed, there's many lists that did this. Uh, it's just one that I want to encourage you guys to go play with. Um, it's not an accident that all these other new systems have created encapsulated closures. Again, we talked about compilation and performance. Uh, we also talked about the, a point I made earlier about um, encapsulation capability being useful for reasoning about programs. If your functions have all their internals exposed all the time, that any library can reach into the insides of every other library and monkey patch things, and it can get hairy. And so there's actually significant engineering benefit uh, to opaque data. 
I don't have my thing set up here to see the next slide, so forgive me for being slightly off pace. Um, but again, that transparency gives lots of power. So you can do really cool things like reach into a function and change things around, which is really great for exploring um, and, and tinkering with, with some sort of thing. So uh, I have some screenshots here of Mathematica. Let me temporarily switch over to that. Um, here's Mathematica, and uh, we're just going to go through a little bit just to play. So, like, here's this first one up top. Can everybody see this? Should I make this bigger? Bigger. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, have to... Let's see. How's that? Cool. Good back there? Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to evaluate these expressions. So, like, here's this first one. So I'm saying, give me the tree form of this, like, little tree. So this is showing that, right, here is... Um, you know, here is sort of the, the parsing of this structure here. But this full form operation is similar to tree form, but it, like, I have something that doesn't look like a traditional expression, it doesn't have a traditional grammar. Um, the grammar here actually includes like under, over, and square root boxes from the front end. And so if you ask for the full form of this, you actually get like this expression out. And so when you perform operations on this, even if internally it's represented as some other data type, the data type that Mathematica presents to you is this expression. And that's really powerful because it scales up. So here we have another abstract data type that's a picture, right? <laughs> so what's the full form of this, right? Like, that works, <laughs> right? Which is pretty friggin' cool because I can copy paste this thing, right? <laughs> and like, I got two of those guys and I multiply them and it's like, and I got like, this thing squared, right? Like, it's wacky. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, it's nuts. Actually, what is the multiplication? What is the multiplication of these two? Yeah, multiply Yeah, it's squared. Well, what's the full form of that? What does that mean? Squared doesn't matter. It's, it's, it, it remains symbolic. It remains symbolic. Yeah. So it's power oh, of that original thing. No, it can't, but I, I, can, I can do fun yeah. stuff. So for example, which, well, I'll come back to this. <laughs> I can replace, I can replace uh, this guy. So this operator here. But one could define a multiple. I could. Yeah, you could. Yeah, oh, I absolutely well, could. So um, Mathematica is just interpreting some. polynomials and all these expressions. Yeah, so Mathematica has built-in stuff for polynomials, for evaluation. So the strategy that Mathematica applies, back in terms of evaluation right. strategy, is one that I would call simplification. What it tries to do is it tries to evaluate any rules that match subject to some sequencing as much as it can everywhere it can. And so the goal is it tries to get you the smallest thing it can to show you in the UI. Bottom up or top down? Uh, it's a mix. It's a mix. So there's a pretty lengthy documentation uh, page about the evaluation strategy in Mathematica as well as the non-standard evaluation strategies because there's all sorts of, there's like five forms of quoting and like all sorts of crazy different things. Uh, and they have like a whole other mode for like turning off evaluation on sub-expressions and it is a very, very rich evaluation model. It's a closed model. You can't change it, but there are many hooks into it. Does, does it have confluence or can you get these ambiguous? So uh, I think it's only confluent because uh, they apply a strict ordering based on definition of rules. So if two rules would both apply, the <coughs> most recently or least recently defined will apply. Okay. And so the system... Uh, by steps confluence. Confluence is a property of a set of rules. That yeah. Says any strategy will produce the same answer. Yeah. So if you have a strategy, and if you have a fixed strategy, you don't have to worry about is your code confluent. Un unless your strategy is <laughs> concurrent, <laughs> which yeah, which we'll talk about in a also moment. The strategy which is crap, which of course produces. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so um, some more examples. Uh, so this is a regular simple expression. Again, the output is all nice. Um, so like I said, this is the operator, this is the replace operator. So if I, if I, if I hold this, you'll see that this is you know, showing it like that. It says don't evaluate it. If I say full form of this, you'll see it gives me the replace all. That's the infix operator, right? And if I release hold on this guy, I think that's right. I get, you know, it evaluates it. So that's quoting and unquoting and all sorts of fun things. You can, you can replace with like a list of rules. So I have this expression, uh, a, I thought I defined A. Did I define A? Yeah, so I have A. So A is 2x plus, you know, y to the third, and I can say replace x and y, and I, and I get an answer. So what's cool about this is now I didn't even have a lambda. I, I, I used an expression that was a, that had three variables, and I used it as an abstraction. I can use that expression, you know, as a building block in bigger things, and just sub things into it from the outside. 
So that's pretty fun. Um, and like I said, it's a simplification strategy. So here's like a uh, sine of pi times x. And if I sub in one for x, you're gonna notice that what happens is extra evaluation happens. It doesn't just put in the one for x and then multiply, like, and do nothing. It puts it in and then it tries to see what rules match and does all the simplification. And so if you were to have like, I mean, so, so it's, it's pretty neat because you're basically saying, well, okay, something changed. Try matching everything and running again and go through the strategy, take it from the top. Uh, here's another weird example. So here I have a rule that's defined f of g of some blank x and I say set it to, you know, g of f of x. So basically swap the f and the g, right? And if I do this where I have f, 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 f of g of one, I get out g of f, 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 f of one. So the evaluation causes this to like bubble through because the evaluation strategy applies all the rules until they can't be applied anymore. So you can't really do that uh, in like a traditional evaluation strategy, like in a, in a uh, an applicative order language. Here's another fun example with uh, some graphics. So here I've made a random, you know, like a little random graph, right? And every time I run it, I get some new side effects for new random. And you'll notice it has this this disk. So table is a uh, is a looping form. It says, you know, make a table of ten of these expressions. And what I want to do is I want to say, well, while I'm exploring, I have this disk, and I can ask for the full form of it. And here's all the disk, right? And I can say, okay, what I want to do is I want to place all the disk at some point P with some radius R with just point P. And I get out points instead of the disk, right? So this idea of operating on expressions like the X, right, and or, the, or plus, I can take that all the way to operating on graphics, which is pretty powerful for, for exploration. Um, here's some other fun examples that I don't really understand because Kovas wrote them. Uh, <laughs> so like this is some crazy combinator thing. Uh, here's some other crazy data types that are like, here's an American flag, and you can get the full form of that. Like it's some entity value, and you can do math with flags and get three flags. <laughs> and if maybe you're a Canadian, you can do that and get three Canadian flags. Like all sorts of crazy stuff. So uh, that's that's just a kind of a really quick Mathematica demo. If you thought that was fun, you should go watch Wolfram go on for hours about all the wacky things it can do. But you know the man's a genius. I mean, yeah, he's 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 I'm sorry. totally bizarre. He invented, he invented cellular autonomy. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, if you so he him, he deserves credit for one thing, him, which is no. I, so he deserves credit for one thing, which is following through, because this is an idea that's an old idea that's been forgotten, forgotten, and he followed through and he hired a bunch of people and he built a bunch of cool shit and he deserves a lot of credit for doing that. And you should totally play with the fruits of that labor because it's a lot of fun. Gone. <laughs> so moving on then, so Stratego, Stratego is a question. What about MATLAB? Any comments on that? I don't know MATLAB very well. My understanding is that it has an as an element of this. However, it uh, just as there are unexpressible data types in like Scheme, there are. My understanding is that there are unexpressible data types in MATLAB, and frankly, there are unexpressible data types in Mathematica as well. You just got to dig pretty far to find them. Um, so all of this is an illusion, right? Uh, but but it's the the illusion works most of the time, which is I guess computers to begin with. Yeah. So uh, Stratego. Files have places and processes have life. Yeah, who knows, right? <laughs> so Stratego is a really cool term writing language um, that is exploring this idea of pluggable evaluation strategies or pluggable rewriting strategies. Uh, check out this link if you want to read a whole bunch of cool papers about it. Um, I'm not going to show Stratego itself because it's kind of big and scary. I'm going to show a little toy uh, racket implementation of Stratego's what they call strategy uh, combinators. So let's go ahead to that demo. <coughs> is this your language? Or? This is racket. And this no, is. Stratego. Who did Stratego? Stratego is done by some great researchers whose names I forgot. Okay. Uh, I'd have to check. Uh, their website has tons of uh, citations and papers and links and Which website downloads. do you use for Racket? Uh, I don't. I'm just going to use Dr. Racket because it's good for the demo here. Oh. Um, so we're going to run this guy. So we've loaded all the expressions and I'm going to take you through. Uh, is there a way to make bigger, this bigger? bigger? Yeah. Let's see. View increased font size. That sounds good. How's that, everyone? <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Um, this is racket types no check um, because I wanted to show you the types 
but then I didn't want to actually annotate all my functions. So, <laughs> um, so the types here are an even simpler expression language where we have an expression is either a symbol or a term, and a term is a pair of a symbol, the head, and a list of arguments. Cool? Yeah. Super simple. So the first one's a type union. Yeah, it's a type union. It's a union of symbol and type, of term, yeah. Some types are <laughs> union types, that's where it's at. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then the strategy is a function of an expression to a option expression. So the idea is a strategy says, I take some expression in and I either fail and return nothing, or I succeed and return a new expression. And this is gonna be our combinator uh, interface. So we're gonna build up a little evaluator out of a pile of these combinator interfaces. And so you can think about this the same way as like parser combinators or whatever. Have you ever seen that technique in functional languages? It's exactly what we're gonna do. Um, for this file, ooh, I guess zooming in, makes it scroll faster too. Uh, so here's the conventions we're gonna use. Basically T is for the subject term, this is the term being rewritten, and then uh, U, V, W are for other terms, and then S, P, Q, and R are going to be for, for strategy. So T is for the subject, U and V, etc., are for other terms, and S, etc., are for strategies. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off and say, I don't want to rewrite uh, a pattern matcher. I just want to talk about the strategy. So we're just going to hijack rackets pattern matcher. So define syntax rule, and we're going to make our own thing called rule that takes a pattern on the left, produces a replacement on the right, and that's defined as if we succeed at matching the pattern, we rewrite it. If we fail at matching the pattern, we return false. That's the option false. So we have our, our simplest strategy, which is succeed and don't change anything. Our next simplest strategy, which is fail and don't do anything else, right? So you see how these are little functions that take in a, a thing and rewrite it. Everyone mostly following, sticking with it? All right, they're going to get harder. Uh, this is pipe. So this is the conjunction. Uh, yes. Syntax rules basically death macro. Uh, syntax rules is using racket, uh, racket or schemes own uh, pattern matching rewrite language for their their hygienic macros. Okay. So they have syntax rules, which is their hygienic macros, which is not full procedural macros. And so I'm just. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that they already have a pattern matcher, right. and so I'm writing a macro that reuses their pattern matcher for an atomic rewrite rule. So pipe is uh, like there are conjunction of two strategies S and P. So if we have two strategies S and P, we can combine them into a new strategy, which operates on T, applies S, gives us U. If that succeeds, applies P, gives us U, otherwise we fail. Or gives us a new U, otherwise we fail. Alt is our disjunctive rule. So we try to match S or one of the other ones. So if S succeeds here, if we say, you know, U, uh, we say S, okay, we have non-mil here, so we, we've got, we've succeeded. Otherwise, if we have nothing left, we fail. Otherwise, we move on to the rest of the list. So this says, try each of these strategies in order until one of them matches. And then, uh, because I don't believe in types, I will just define term as being uh, just as good as list. I'm, I'm kidding, by the way. Uh, and then, and then, uh, so we have this other, this one other primitive I'm going to show, which is called all. So what this does is this is all children. This says, given some strategy S, apply it to all children of term T. So if T is a term, meaning it may have children, then we're going to map over all the children. You don't need to know all these little racket things, but whatever. You can basically just cons up the new list of the children, or potentially fail. And so this strategy has to apply to all the children to succeed. So if you're doing like variable substitution, you want Yeah, so if you want to walk down the tree, you can use all to visit all children. There are other primitives that, that um, Stratego shows. They have lots of them. This is all we need for my demos for today. So you can go read the Stratego papers. You can go add more to this library. This, we're down at line 59, and we have like all the primitives. And I think by line 80, we're going to have the entire standard library. So for my really, really small subset. So here's the standard library, a small subset of the standard library. Try it says, attempt some strategy. If that fails, don't do anything. Right? Pass just rewrites A to A or U to U. Repeat says, you know, do S and then repeat S, and then if that fails, do nothing. So this says, repeat S, do S, do S, do S, do S, do S. Do S, do S. Keeps going until the rule fails to match. Top down. 
Okay, so I'm not actually gonna use top down in my examples, but I'm gonna do it for show it next to bottom up. Basically, top down says do S, and then for all the children, recurse, top down. Bottom up says recurse and do all the children, and then uh, and then uh, apply S. So this says apply a rule at a at a at a node and then its children or at a node and or at the bottom and then either way. So then we have innermost, which is Similar to bottom up, right? It uses bottom up, but it adds an extra step in here with the innermost and the bottom up. So what it's going to do is where a top down goes bang, 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 and then bottom up goes boom, 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 right? Well, innermost goes boom, 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 boom. Okay, I fail. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, I fail. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, I fail. And so bottom up uh, basically just does one pass from the bottom to the top, and innermost we're going to keep applying this with a Q and got breath first. Yeah, it's, it's really, well, it's it's conceptually. Yeah, yeah. So it's actually, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and that actually does matter if you have side effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, none of my things have side effects, nor do I do any substitution, or do I do any like dynamic binding, so I like sidestep all of those problems. So you can run headfirst into those when you play with this later. Um, so we'll go back to our Boolean expression example. Here is a bag of evaluation rules. So what I'm going to do is I'm defining this, this uh, Evaluation guy, and I'll evaluate it so you'll see. Sadly, it's not, it's not expressible. <laughs> um, if if I head back to Mathematica, right, you'll you'll see that if I had some rules, like if I had like, you know, rules equal some list, I can trivially do that and say, you know, not true goes to false, and of course that works. And now if I say not true, we're good, and now I can you know say, well, wait, what are my rules again? Oh, they're not that. Okay, so I can say you know, not true, and then rewrite it with the rules, and boom, we're done. So it's kind of cool to be able to have your rules as first class data. Sadly, they're not expressible. Uh, you can write an interpreter for your rules instead of a combinator style library, and then you can make them expressible. You should try that, that's fine. Um, it's pretty easy, you just take all the combinators and turn them into an external interpreter over some quoted data structure. So here, not true to false, not false to true, and true to x, or you know, if I have both, if I have x is, if I have true and something else, then it's the something else. Uh, similarly for or, if I have true, then I know it's true. If I have something else other than true, then I know it's the other guy. Um, those are the evaluation rules. So here, I've got this function now, evaluate, which says apply the bottom-up strategy of repeatedly evaluating. So if I do evaluate, not true, get false, all right? And that's all the primitives I showed you. There's no, like, this is, it's, it's, it's really simple, like, all the things I showed. So, like, if I have and true and unknown, right? Unknown is a symbol. So it doesn't, it's not the symbol false or true, so, but it still just treats it symbolically, like, out of the gate, right? Like, this, this very simple mechanism just gives you symbolic reasoning de facto, like, out of the box, which is pretty fun. Um, and you can do, you know, more complex things, like this one, and it's, the simplification happens because it's like, well, I know an and not true or true, so obviously that's true. Um, and we can go back to that example we showed at the beginning of the talk with conjunctive normal form. So here we have a double negation rule. Not not A is A. De Morgan's uh, and distributive or, right? So basically these are rules for rewriting expressions and doing other transformations of expressions. If we combined all these rules and applied them willy-nilly, we might get something not confluent, we might not get the result we want. But if we apply them with... Uh, these strategies in this order, <laughs> with this innermost operation, we get conjunctive normal form operations. So for example, conjunctive normal form of not or or an A, this is and not A, not B, right? Conjunctive normal form of this guy, right? So and, so this is, a, this is an and of ors. Yeah. So, um, and this even works, uh, even though I don't have variadic, it, it's an and of an and of ors. So it produces the, the, if you flatten these out and had variadic rules, which are just a little bit messier, you can, you can get the conjunctive normal form flat. But this is a working rewrite system. And you can add primitives to it really easily. You can add new strategies to it really easily. You can experiment with different strategies. You can use rules and strategies higher order. And you can build pretty sophisticated rewrite systems. And if you do a little bit of trickery with side effects and other things, you can... Uh, build things up to the complexity of something like Mathematica's gigantic 
rewrite strategy that it has in the box. So um, the yeah. trick we I had in mind was uh, existential variables. Yes, so you can do rewrite systems for logics with binders. It gets hairy. Yes. Because you got to mm -hmm. worry about substitution, right, right, capture right. of yeah. variable names, and all sorts of things. And so it can get pretty messy. Jensen. Yeah, and so <laughs> Jensen becomes your best friend. Exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, which is then a side effect, and you have other problems. And, uh, and so, so there's, again, it's another one of the reasons that, uh, that this is maybe too powerful. You can do all of these things. But you have to do it in a way that is sort of, oh, well, I now introduce a global side effect of renaming things or introducing gen sims. Okay. Um, and so while anything can be expressed this way, it's often preferable to express it other ways. But I've actually, re I've actually written a rewrite system that has closures as a term. And so instead of having, so if, if, the, inve if the environment is expressible as a expression and the lambda is an expression, then a closure is just a lambda plus the environment. And so you can make all those things work mm -hmm. uh, environment style. And in fact, the operational semantics of many languages are expressed that way yeah. instead of substitution. Right. Um, once you get into logics and, and you know quantifiers and other sorts of binders, yeah. binders are always hard. Yep. Um, so yeah. One question. Sure. Uh, can you explain the difference between this and just normal evaluation and compilation? And then the second part is like, why would you use a rewrite system over just using an evaluator? So um, that's, this, is the, this is the point I made about, about there being multiple evaluation strategies. Mm -hmm. So when you have a normal programming language, they've chosen an evaluation strategy for you. And so you talk about call by name like in uh, or, or, call, or lazy evaluation in Haskell or applicative order evaluation like in a traditional like scheme. Those two evaluation strategies are both expressible in this framework. And you, you can only express one or the other subject to some you know, constraints. You can add macros and whatever to one, or you can add strictness annotations to the other. Mm -hmm. But those two strategies are oil and water when they are, are sealed off from you. Here, I'm building an evaluation strategy. And so this lets me experiment with them. And there may be rewrite systems that are different than traditional programming. So here I showed a logic system mm -hmm. right, of uh, Boolean expressions. So I got conjunctive normal form out, which I may have wanted as opposed to the answer. I might not have wanted to know. So if I could, I could comment out evaluation here, right? rerun this guy, and say, now I want to get the conjunctive normal form of this expression uh, here. And so because I removed that rule um, about what to do with or true, that didn't get evaluated. So it remains symbolic. <coughs> and so this lets me experiment with evaluation strategies. Let's let me use evaluation strategies for different things besides traditional programming languages. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, keeping things symbolic light allows you to do meta reasoning too. Yeah. True. A, a nice way to put it is that term rewriting systems don't have constructor discipline. That is, they have no notion that a, <coughs> there, there, there's no distinction between a, Reduce, but the, it's only the distinction between, between reducible and non reducible terms. Like, you know, if you have A dot B, that's non reducible. There's nothing you can say with A dot B. Lisp systems will not let you mix that up and say, oh, but I want a reduction rule for that. I want that to, I want 1 dot 2 to become 3. So, so, so to clarify that, uh, this notion of a, of, a, of a constructor discipline is that if you have a data type, for example, yeah. um, in, in, in Haskell, you make an abstract data type, you say, I have you know, some type node of left and right. The node constructor name, that tag, is like the head of an exp S expression in a Lisp, mm -hmm. right? So the thing is, is that what, what the con this constructor discipline means is that the set of heads of expressions are disjoint for like rules that rewrite stuff, like a function call, and things that are inert, that don't do anything, like data. And so they separate those two. In a uh, rewrite system, you have no obligation to separate those two. So I can do things like, where's my Mathematica again? So I can make a data type, like I have, uh, let's make this bigger. Um, I can make a data type like I have like, uh, like a tree, of, or let's just call it a node, of like another node, and we'll call this like one and two, and node of like three and four, and this does nothing, it's data. Right, and like I can, I can treat this like data. Like I can say, so like that's output thirty-four. I can say, okay, give me output thirty-four's, uh, you know, head. Right, it's a node. But now I can define a, a rule. I can say, like node of a, of some blank a and some blank b is rewritten to a plus b. 
and do that. And now I'm done. So now if I were to ask for a 34 again, I get 10. So I've replaced the meaning of the word node, the head node. I took it from being a constructor mm -hmm. to being a, uh, a function. And by, by making a, a rule mm -hmm. and defining a rule to that symbol. And, and, and you've given it some that, that, that with built-in text just as well. Yeah. And if you want to define a function called you know, three of four, where three is a function that multiplies itself by its argument, that works. <laughs> and, and then you can shoot yourself in the foot very, very quickly. Um, I like to joke that Mathematica is an environment where it's very easy that the very last expression you evaluate it is the only one that is correct. <laughs> it's actually really simple to like screw yourself royally by just like changing the semantics of everything. It's almost too powerful. But that means it's really great for exploring, and it's really great if you like want to build it for a particular purpose-built need. How am I doing on time? Got it. Do okay? I think so. All right. Uh, yeah, you're fine. Cool. All right, so we've talked a little bit about where it came from in math and the past. We talked a little bit about the present. We saw some cool demos. Uh, well, I guess like 88 to present. Uh, uh, and now I want to talk a little bit about the future. So this is a, a really, really cool bit of research by these guys whose names I'm not going to butcher uh, called the K Framework. And uh, K is, I guess, to be, the name K is to be reminiscent of continuation, which is spelled with a C, or computation, which is also spelled with a C. Um, <laughs> is that what it is? Oh, cool. Got it. Thank awesome. you. I've wanted to know for so long. So, say it again. Uh, he said yeah, in German, uh, like computation and continuation are with a K, I guess. Oh, yeah? Okay. Which one is it? Computation or continuation? <laughs> continuation? I think, I think continuation. Okay, all right. I'm just going to butcher that fact for the rest of my life. It's fine. Um, so this is the abstract abstract. This is me abstracting over there, wordy abstract. Uh, so, wait, 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 wait. Abstract abstract. Yeah, this is me giving you an abstraction of their abstract. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, an ex executable semantic framework. When you see this, this is fancy researcher give me funding terms for term rewriting language. But there's no semantics. It's all syntax. Yeah, something like that. Uh, who knows? All right. That's what John Talon just said. All right. Well, in any case, uh, basically, it makes use of configurations, computations, and rules. So configuration is like I showed earlier, right? I had the expression and the environment. Um, you can make whatever you want kind of configuration. You define it for your machine. Computations, which is a special case handling of rules governing the... Do we, we lose something? Is there a problem? No, 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 no. I think Francois had a question and it oh. appeared on the screen, but then it disappeared. <laughs> so, uh, so, so computations are a special category of rules for single-threaded execution. We'll talk about it a little bit in a moment. And rules are, as we've been seeing much of, but uh, K-Framework takes this idea pretty far, so we'll talk about how. Um, what's worth noting here is that they don't just use traditional expressions that we talked about earlier. They extend their expressions to include lists, maps, sets, and bags, okay. multi-sets may sound familiar to the closure folks in the audience. Basically, they've lifted the expressible domain to include extra data types that are really common in, uh, in semantics. Did, was there a question here? No? OK. Uh, and what's really particularly interesting about K-Framework is that it is an executable semantic framework that is suitable for defining concurrent languages, which is like a totally wacky thought, and we'll talk about in a moment. That is to say that it's called CC. Uh, no. No, is richer than that. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, so here is a K definition of a simple language called IMP, uh, which stands for imperative. What I want to point out uh, here is, so we have the syntax on the left. This is uh, BNF style. Uh, these are some strictness annotations we'll talk about in a moment. And these are the semantics of this language. So uh, I'll point out, you don't need to know all this stuff. Wait. Wait, but semantics is not term rewriting. Semantics is actual things like memory location or absolute. Yes, memory. yes, yes, yes. So, so sure. okay. okay, so uh, maybe my slides are in the wrong order here. No, I, okay. no, 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 no. There's, there's, we'll talk about configuration in a moment. All right. All right. So, okay, so you have configuration, which is here is the representation of the machine. Okay, here's an expression that represents our machine. And that's not the same thing as, this, as these little things that get rewritten. They're different kinds of objects. Machine is different from little scribbling on the screen. No, I understand. So what we're going to no, do? I know you understand. Well, yeah. So 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 what, what I'm what I'm going to okay, sure. So what we're what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, rewriting subsets of a configuration, which is an expression that represents a machine. Ah, okay. 
You with me now? You... No, I'm very happy. Excellent. I'm very happy. Awesome. <laughs> so you are. Down. This is much better than monads for introducing categories. Uh, what? It's a monad. Do you want to give us a tutorial? No. Or... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so if you bear with me for a moment, we'll go through this guy. You don't need to know all the syntax here. I just want to point out a couple of features of this language. Um, they have a LaTeX style rendering, um, but there's also a like full form style rendering. You can type this in if you really wanted to. Um, and I guess that's how they actually use it, and they lie to you because everybody typesets everything, which I guess is cool, but who knows? Uh, but I use Vim, so uh, basically here, uh, this is just a rule. There's like there's two. These are contextual rules. So basically, this is saying that these rules are applying to K, which is a labeled part of the configuration. We'll see more about configurations in a moment. And state, uh, and then these are like blanks. And then if something's written under a blank, that's the same as a left to right rewrite rule. So if you see this, where the rule is like that below, um, I think that's what they were also trying to show before, but then it didn't make any sense. I didn't want to. I didn't want to like commit to that. The point is that they use both notations. They use this this under notation and this rewrite notation. I'm not sure why they that's use just one. To confuse the reader. Right? Yeah, they just want to fuck with you. Okay. That's basically what it is. You will explain what state and K are later. I, I'll get to that in a moment. Yeah. So the, this, those are subsets of the configuration, which is representation of the machine. Um, and so this rule is contextual. And by machines being applying the rewrite rules. Say again? Machines applying the rewrite rules. These are the rewrite rules. Yeah. Machines is the machine being modeled. Oh, that's true. Not the machine executing these rules. Oh, got it, got it, got it. So there is also a machine that will execute these rules against a model. Okay. okay. And then we go turtles all the way down. Yeah. So um, some other things. There's some built-in rules. So if you have some expression like, you know, I plus I1 plus I2, they rewrite it to I1 plus uh, plus int of I2. So they have built-in magic rules. So you have some <laughs> syntax uh, that you want to define in your language and say, well, in my language, plus means plus int in the built-in language. Um, there's this notion of followed by. So here we have, if you have the concatenation of statement one and statement two in the language, then that gets rewritten to this little followed by symbol, statement one, statement two. So this little followed by is part of their magic built-in rules. They have handling of followed by. And so what you do is you um, take some part of your configuration and what they call activate or make hot. You make this expression hot by rewriting it into an expression that has linear execution behavior internally to their meta machine. Um, and then the other one is these annotations. So these strictness annotations are because there are many common popular evaluation strategies like the ones we talked about, you can see uh, evaluation strategies with Wikipedia or whatever. Um, so these are things like which arguments get evaluated before those rules apply. So it's much simpler to declare these things. So they have this notion of annotations. Uh, and in this case, they have annotations about strictness. So this says if then else is strict in its first argument. So you evaluate this Boolean expression uh, first, and then these rules can apply. So by having strictness annotations, it saves you a whole bunch of typing to add all the evaluation strategy rules. So it turns out that if you're really careful about confluence and other things, you can actually constrain your rules in such a way that you'll get the right behavior, you'll get linearization, you'll get strictness, but it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also really verbose. And so they have these annotations that generate rules for you and to ensure that the rules are a little bit more manageable. So is there a difference, um, maybe there is, between just pure rewrite rules that have no semantics and rewrite rules that are providing interpretations, some form of So in K, all the interpretation happens around the K part of the configuration, which we'll see <clears throat> in the next slide. And then everything else, the semantics come from the language of K. So, so K defines some syntax for rules, and those semantics you inherit. Uh, your language doesn't necessarily inherit them, but you're, you, you, you're forced to live with them as you write these rules. Right. Ray, I think I think the pure rewrite system would be the Turing machine. Mm -hmm. Well, it's absolutely pure, and it's got no semantics. Or it is I mean, what, what uh, maybe ask that rewrite. question was when he was going from concatenation to the follow stuff. Has got a lot of yeah. So, so the strategy, the strategy that um, the strategy that K applies is one of find all the rules that apply concurrently. Simultaneously, it searches for all rules that can apply and executes them. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that most rules only apply 
because they are they have those strictness annotations, make them contextual on the K part of the configuration, the continuation. Mm -hmm. And so you take your whole program, stick it on K, mm -hmm. and then the way the system's set up is that it makes it so that that gets thrown through a peephole, right? And it gets all funneled, so it has to happen linearly. And because all the rules can only happen on the front of that, uh, you can, there's like command line flags and stuff. You can say like, if there's ambiguous rules in the head of the continuation, fail, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It can get crazy. Right, right. Uh, and I'm gonna show you how crazy it can get because the system is actually capable of describing formal semantics for the challenge language. And let me, let me read to you this. <laughs> let me take a drink of water here. <laughs> the challenge language starts with arithmetic expressions, then gradually grows in complexity by adding expressions with side effects, memory allocations and pointers, lists, aspects, functions, recursion, college current continuation, non-determinism, <laughs> multi-threading with shared memory and synchronization, agents of synchronous and asynchronous communication with broadcasting and barriers and constructs for co-generation and evaluation. In short-lived. Yes, very good. Plus Erlang, plus other things, yeah. right? So yeah. uh, <laughs> this is a this is a big language. It is a terrible, ugly, stupid language, and they admit that. The point is that they just wanted to cram one of everything in there to show that their framework could do it. <laughs> and they have a mission to go actually provide K framework implementations of their semantics for C, for Java, for for you know Scheme and all the list and whatever. They like are on a mission to formalize every semantics everywhere, and so they had to be able to do all of these things. And what's really neat is that this paper, uh, oh, well, we'll I'll come back in a moment, but this is the configuration for the challenge language. So, bigger, bigger, bigger. You, it, there's nothing to see here, but like, <laughs> it's just so much crap. So, like, the challenge configuration is made out of agent configurations and it has messages, and then agents have threads, and threads have environments, and then, like, it's crazy. There's actually another way to view this, uh, which is pictorially. All right, and so this is the nesting of the configuration. So T is the top, that's the machine configuration, right? Then there's these IO bits, there's a message queue, there's some like global state, and then you have all your agents, and then each agent has, there's many agents, and then each agent has multiple threads or has this stuff, like each agent has its own memory, and then threads have a continuation, there it is, right? So this is built in. This is like the one built in thing on this whole damn slide, right? You have environments, you have all sorts of crazy stuff in here. You don't need to understand all this. You just need to realize that, like, this is a complex expression. Wait, wait. how big is this actually textually? Once you have the, the K system. Well, here's here's a definition of it textually. And that actually is it. This is this, it. this is the That's same the as this. Definition? This is the whole definition. That's pretty impressive. It's pretty damn impressive. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty impressive. So now, how big is the source code to the K system? Uh, I don't know, but I think the challenge language is probably like, like, a couple thousand lines, two, okay. three thousand lines. Got it. Okay. Um. You know, in, in ASCII, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so all this, plus like seven pages of rules surrounded by explanatory prose, uh, explains the semantics for the challenge language as well. That's pretty good. It's really impressive. We're not gonna go into the whole language, I just wanna show uh, a cool concurrency example because we hadn't talked about concurrency before. So I'm going to talk about that now. Here is, uh, it may be a little hard to see, so I'll, I'll read some, I'll, I'll read it a bit. I might read that up top. Basically, we're going to implement two things using concurrent rules, right? So these little square, these angle brackets are contextual matches. Basically, they're saying, here, match inside K, inside that big nested structure, right? Um, match inside holds, inside that big nested structure. And in the paper, they work out all the details about what matches when, and if you have nested things, and like figuring out how to, what matches where, and how to override, etc. So this is saying that I want to do thread synchronization. So if I have on the continuation an acquire statement followed by whatever the rest of the continuation is, I can remove the acquire statement if I simultaneously, you know, have no hold on, on me or on a variable or whatever. I can acquire that variable V, right? And then I put V on the busy list. So this dot is nothing. So remove acquire, replace it with that, right? Or I'll have busy, you know, this is sub in V. So the dot represents like a zero width expression. And so what this does is this says, let's me acquire a lock on V, and it keeps a count of the number of holds on a lock. So this says acquire lock V. If it's not locked already, then it becomes locked. If it's locked already, then I increment it. If I release a hold on V, then I delete that expression off the head of the continuation. I rewrite it with you know, the decrementing the number. If I release it and it goes to zero, then I clear it out of the hold map, or the busy map, the hold the busy map. I think busy is a set of things that are busy. 
So these four lines, expand to like 10 lines of ASCII, right, um, is actually enough to represent the semantics of re-entrant locks. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, and this last one's even cooler, because this is rendezvous synchronization. So you have two threads, both of them have a K. Remember we had many agents that had many threads, each of them have a K, that's a current continuation, and they both have rendezvous of some variable V, and if these two nonlinear patterns equate with each other, then we just remove rendezvous from the, both of the, the head of both the continuations. So there are not two threads waiting on the same V. Nothing happens, these threads block, because no rules match the head of the continuation. So this rule, it just says rendezvous V goes to nothing in some continuation if there's another continuation with rendezvous V. Let's you have two threads that wait in a barrier. And that's a one-liner to describe the semantics. That's, 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 that's super cool. Yeah. So like this sort of stuff is what I'm talking about when I say like term rewriting is crazy powerful. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine that if you can implement rendezvous synchronization in one line, how bad can you screw it up if you type something <laughs> wrong here, right? So like really bad, really badly. Um, so that's the, this is the future of rewriting. Um, basically saying that we're gonna, we're gonna expand our expressible category to include maps, sets, you know, bags. Uh, we're gonna use rewrite strategies that are potentially concurrent. And we're going to add pattern matching constructs for contextual rules, for nonlinear patterns, etc. And uh, that's basically it, right? So I have the bubble wrap here. You should all play with the bubble wrap poppy thing. It's so fun. Um, so it's dangerously powerful, term rewriting, rewriting in general. It's crazy fun. You should all learn Mathematica. It's like mind expanding. It's fun. Uh, I use it all the time for actual like thinking and working and doing stuff. And uh, it also gives you some insight into all the formally goodness you see when you see it like operational and denotational and other sorts of semantics and fun things in research papers. You'll, you'll be able to read them after playing with this a little bit and getting a feel for, for how term rewriting works. And, uh, and that's it. That's all. Lots of folks were shouting questions, and I, I hope I fielded those well. If there are other questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them as well. Yes. So on, this, on the slide where you have the acquire, yep. if the acquire is inside of an if statement, then the state of the lot might be taken or it might not be taken. Ah, so if it's inside an if statement. So the way that works, uh, here. So the way that works is because uh, the continuation here, so this is the... Uh, I think that they change their notation a little bit in between. There really should be one of those little like curvy arrows right here saying the continuation is a sequence. This underscore scans in for any zero or more length portion of the sequence. And so what this is saying is that if this is inside an if, well, that's already happened. This gets to the head of the continuation. There's not an underscore on this side. So the continuation is a sequence of commands to execute. And you can actually rewrite any part of that sequence. You can rewrite it at the end of it if you want. It's just convention that we use the left-hand side of the continuation sequence. And the continuation sequence may just be like one thing or two things, but you can use it like a stack and push and pop things from it. And so if there was an if defined elsewhere in the semantics, and, and they are like two pages ahead of this in the paper, um, they basically say, okay, if I have some expression if a Boolean condition, then else, etc. what I do is I rewrite that into a continuation where I push two things onto K. I push... Um, First, I push uh, a branch on a Boolean, left or right, and then I push the, uh, the, the Boolean expression to evaluate, if I'm gonna be strict in the evaluation of my, my condition. So I push that, and now I say, okay, run all the rules that apply. Well, the if is now on the stack, so to speak, it's on the continuation. So the Boolean expression gets evaluated, right? It gets substituted onto the stack by some rule that says, here is the current expression, because K is only part of the configuration. So there's also, this, you can do this as the stack of operations to be preceded, but you could also have some extra state over here that's like whether there's a Boolean going on or what the current expression being evaluated is or whatever. And so by the time that's done, you get to this statement. This is now at the head of the execution queue. And so the if is already done. Does that make sense? This is a standard compiler problem, right? Where uh, at the at the end of the if statement, D is either locked or not locked. You don't know, so you have to you have to do a join 
between two ifs. Whether you put it in continuation or not doesn't really matter. So, so it just helps the rules fire. Yeah. So the the so k is basically just a sequence, and there's other state. So that other state is going to get flattened out onto k as rules match. And so the join. So the, so like you could have. Let's say you had like a like a uh, a stack language, right? And a stack language, you like put a boolean on the stack, then you put the then thunk on the stack, and then you put the else thunk on a stack, and then you say if the first, the third thing on the stack or the first thing on the stack is true, throw away the else thunk and then run the then thunk. And so you could, that's a stack, but this is basically a queue. So you can do the same thing. And so what this is saying is that if at the head of the queue there's an acquire statement, then and these other things also are true simultaneously, then execute that rule. If not, uh, so there may be the join point past that, right? Uh, it may be in this underscore, which is just going to get preserved through the rewrite. So that that would be separate semantics. And what's nice about this model is that they compose. I can implement the then, the if then else, and I can implement this, and then I can have a language with ifs or without ifs with. Uh, rendezvous and thread synchronization or without, um, and they compose as well as they operate on the same schemas. Um, but note that a large portion of the schema is missing here because these rules are contextual. And so you don't actually have to, to specify every little detail, so they'll compose relatively well. Any other questions? Ray? Um, I just have a comment. Um, so in the um, Well, I mean, no. No, no problem. In the, 70s, <laughs> in the 70s, there were a lot of AI systems that were written to do symbolic reasoning. And one of them uh, was done by uh, Doug Lennett, who actually um, created the Psych project. I don't know if you guys heard of the Psych. Huge knowledge, knowledge base uh, based out of Austin, Texas. Um, anyway, his, um, his system AM was actually written to discover new interesting facts in mathematics. And it worked by basically using term rewriting yep. on mathematical expressions. And it's very famous for having discovered Goldbach's conjectures. Ah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, automated theorem proving is a very active field these days. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I didn't. Yeah, it's actually a lot. That would have a whole other talk. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even bother to begin to mention it. Yeah. Yes. Sure. I, I just have two remarks. One of them. Um, oh, yeah, I told him he couldn't have one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is um, one of them, very, very broad. Um, of course, this whole thing, and it's been pointed out before by several other people interrupting and asking questions, you're crushing <laughs> the whole, you have one picture of how actual computers operate, and term rewriting consists of throwing away massive quantities. That. Yeah, that's fine. There's, that there's no bytecode, right. yeah. no actual machine, there's no memory, there's no disk, yeah. there's no nothing. Okay, sort of. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's as if you know, you're, uh, it, it's as if you did all your computations in place, right? And you can't store anything. I, I know by devices, as we know, because if it's good enough. To okay. But the second thing I wanted to say is an actual um, type mathematical statement. Um, the usual, the usual reason that your first slide, you know before you look at it, that that term rewriting system, which we won't bother to define, that that is confluent is because of the following very important theorem, which will shortly dominate the field of homotopy type theory. <laughs> and the theorem has been long known. It's that for the that style of rewriting system, like when we first slide, we know they're going to be confluent for a very simple reason. We're now going to reintroduce something I just described with crushing, a real semantics. So plus and times now have a meaning. They're not term rewriting, that track, syntax, um, you know, a said. Sure they none are. of that. Sure they are, yeah. but there's still no, 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 no. There's none of that. They're actual. They're actual. You have sets of things. Let's assume the integers. Neither functionally pure, <laughs> nor is it a pure rewriting system. It has <laughs> lexical closures that are not expressible. That said, it is a very neat language because it is a traditional. Whatever happened to Shen? Shen, I don't know anything about Shen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have actually the impression that Wolfram had combined mathematics with AI systems. I, 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 I filter everything.
everything they say through like the lens of like, oh, that's neat. So I mean, I really don't know. Maybe it's just more like Cool. All right. Well, well, thank you, everyone. So for those of you who want to go out drinking with us, um, we're going to a pub on 14th Street called McKenna's Pub. The actual address is 250 West 14th Street. Um,